So you know what I just realized? What? We have never once reintroduced ourselves on the pod. Oh, yeah. Do you know how most guests or sorry, most hosts are like, welcome back. This is your host, Sam, and I'm here with Gina or whatever. They say it like in every episode or or to close an episode. They'll be like, and remember, this is Nathan and this is whatever. We've never done that. You're right. I actually didn't. I just never thought of it as something that we had to do. But people probably don't even know which one I is speaking right now. <laughs> they're like, which one is that? It's like the the Korean one, but they're both Korean. It's like the one with dark hair. They both have dark hair. I was just thinking, like, there's so many episodes that I listen to of a podcast where I don't go back in time to figure out who's who. And if there are right. two guests, I just listen. And it takes me a long time to figure out who's which who. one is which. Unless yeah. I do my own personal research beforehand on Instagram or something like that. So just for the record, I'm Sam. And I'm Gina. <laughs> I wonder if we're going to make this more regular, but I, it feels really weird to reintroduce ourselves. It does feel weird, but I guess you're right because I'm assuming they can see us and tell right. the difference. Right. Or I think in our storytelling we'll, where I'll say something like, oh, one time Sam said this, which then right. implies. But it takes a while to get totally to does. the story. So I was right. just thinking if I was a random listener, I'd be like, who's who? We're one. <laughs> we are one. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, I'm so excited to unpack our topic today, Spiralers, because this is something that Gina and I have both personally dealt with, and it's a wound that so many of us have, although it may not manifest in this way, mm -hmm. but today we want to talk about perfectionism. It's such a big topic, especially because I think a lot of people, I mean, us included, don't think we're actually dealing with perfectionism. Yeah. Um, because it takes on a lot of different faces. It takes on so many different faces. And I think if we, whenever we hear perfectionism, we think that that means that we think we're perfect mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. that we're even trying to be, but we don't really identify with that. We just have an obsession with trying to make things right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And perfectionism is coming from this deep, deep wound, which actually shares a sister. The sister of perfectionism is actually procrastination. Mm -hmm. I always say perfectionism, the two P's, perfectionism and procrastination are on the same ends of the same spectrum or yeah. different ends of the same spectrum. And that spectrum and where you fall on that spectrum will have everything to do with your fear of what happens if you are seen or if you don't do it the way that you had expected, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have an arbitrary expectation for yourself to perform in a certain way, what happens to you when you don't meet that expectation, that self-set expectation, or maybe society set expectation for you, and your fear of that will either cause you to shut down and withdraw, aka procrastinate, or it will hyper um, activate you or upregulate you into anxiety and constant performance and checking and needing to make everything right. Mm -hmm. And Essentially, neither of these are going to actually help you secure your safety and heal the wound. They actually perpetuate the wound. Another P. <laughs> Three Ps. Perpetuate, <laughs> procrastinate, perfect. Yes. Yeah. And I think perfectionism for me personally was something that was more obvious, I think, in my 20s, mm -hmm. where I really was trying to be, uh, again, maybe I wouldn't have used the word perfect, but it probably sounded like good enough yeah. or I need to make this right. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people say, I, I just need to make this right or I got to get this right. Um, or when we believe that you're only going to get one chance to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way that it showed up a lot for me in my life. And I think in this season of my life, you know, in, in the 30s, it's a lot more sneaky. I think in the 20s, we're trying to look a certain way. We're trying to mm -hmm. come off a certain way. We want to measure ourselves up to someone else's standard or even just physically, the way that we want to look mm -hmm. needs to be a certain way and we can't feel good until we get there. Um, but yeah, I'll say that in my 30s, it's, come, it's become a lot more sneaky where I don't notice it as obviously as I used to. Yeah, I think it's so obvious in like middle school and high school, like you said, it starts with your appearance and you yeah. know fitting in. And then later on, it kind of finds its way in the way that you are creating or working. And mm -hmm. then it finds, yeah, it finds so many ways to erode your sense of peace and self-acceptance and your constant need. Your perfectionism really is the need to be better. Yes. Like whatever that means to you. So what I hear for clients a lot is now that I've done this, I need to get to like 
the next level. Yeah. Like there's, but the thing is, is that there's always a next level, right? Yeah. And so that can either upregulate you into anxiously trying to attain the next level, or you may fear that you may not get to the next level and make a negative meaning making about that. And so you're going to fall on either ends of the spectrum. But the way to heal perfectionism is actually not to get to the next level. Yeah. Because getting to the next level perpetuates that you needed to do that in order to feel okay, yes. which then gives birth to another level that you yeah. must obtain. But is to realize that who you are now is actually the same person of worth the same acceptance and love as the person at the next level. Yeah. Which doesn't pressure you to get to the next level, but actually helps you lovingly blossom into the person that is at the quote unquote next level. Mm -hmm. And I think when we believe that the next level or the next achievement or the next improvement to ourselves if that is what is going to help us access a better belief or a better version of us, then we're attached to it. Totally. And I think that's why it's so harmful a lot of times when we do get to that next level because yeah. we believe that that next level is what is what is what makes us feel good. Like it's that yes. that's making me feel proud of myself, but it's 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 not. Um it's a very false sense of being proud of yourself. What you're really saying in those moments is, okay, I achieved this thing and other people can see this and I've met this marker and it's it's not internal at all. It's all external, which again perpetuates the belief that you need to get to that next level to feel that same feeling again. Um, but it can be really hard to believe that you can feel good about yourself or love yourself without getting to another level. Yeah, especially if you always give it to yourself exactly. when you get there, right? Yeah. I always say ego loves capitalism. Mm -hmm. Like capitalism is the perfect breeding ground for continuing to strive because so there's so much incentive for it, yeah. right? Like capitalism basically says, you know, pull up your own bootstraps and do it well and do it better and you'll be rewarded more and more and more. Yeah. And so then we continue to be on this treadmill of wanting to have more, but it's the wanting more that makes us feel like we're in lack. Yeah. It's not that we get more and we feel better because we continue to perpetuate the pattern that we need more to feel better. Mm -hmm. And so there's always this gap. And the other thing I've noticed about perfectionism is that we're ultimately running away from this fear of punishment. And that punishment necessarily is not going to come from the outside, although it might have when you were a child, which could have been the birthplace of this pattern. But now the punishment is self-driven. So, for example, if I'm not going to get to the next level or if I don't do this right or if I don't get this, I'm going to be mean to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be disappointed in myself. I'm going to judge myself. I'm going to believe I'm a lesser version of myself. All of these drive guilt and shame, and we don't want to feel those things. Yeah. And so if it's true that not getting it right is going to bring about this feeling of guilt and shame, then of course we have to be crazy trying to be perfect or we avoid trying to do it at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that, that you said that because it really is just an avoidance of something or we're running away from something or we're running to something, why we're running to something that we think is going to save us from this feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's actually so funny because it's another P, the punishment, right? Ooh, so when, yeah. when you procrastinate, when you are trying to be perfectionistic, it leads to procrastination, which leads to a perpetuation of that same pattern. And then you start punishing yourself. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, lot, a lot of peace. But I think even the punishing part, I think a lot of people don't think they even do that. They're like, I don't punish myself mm. if I don't get there. But it's very insidious because it's in your mind and happens so fast. And when our barometer is up here for self-punishment, the talking to ourselves in a mean way doesn't even trigger the barometer. Like you don't actually We're so used think, to it. Yeah, like you don't actually think that that's mean. It's kind of like, actually, this happens a lot to you and I both in therapy. When we might talk about something about something our parents did or our moms did and the therapist is like, oh, I can't believe that. And we're like, what? They like clutch their pearls and yes. we're like, what? What did I say? It's, They're like, that was painful. That hurt. And I'm like, like, oh, that? You're like, that's the regular day in life. Yeah, that, that, that's nothing. Let me let me tell you what else she said. And, and we were so used to that. Yeah. And I think that happens so often internally in our own minds that we don't even notice that it's happening. I know. And so part of healing this wound is really attuning to what is happening in my brain when I actually slow down enough to notice okay I really want to do this thing and I need to make it just right actually following the thread of thoughts of what happens if it's not like what if yeah. everybody were to say this was terrible this is not good enough what would happen inside of you then and that will start to illuminate the internal dialogue that is happening unconsciously 
and what your nervous system is really running away from. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that most people avoid, right? Because they're afraid of actually making contact with that. What if I don't get it right? But that's actually what takes away its power. And that's why I love coaching so much because I get to ask those questions. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, And then they have to respond. And what's really important is they also get to hear themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I ask someone, what happens to you if you don't get to the next level? Or what happens to you if this is not the smashing success that you hope that it will be? They'll hear themselves say something like, "Um, then, like, I suck or something like that. And I'm like, you suck? And they're like, Yeah, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? Like they have this moment where they hear it and then with discernment, they're able to notice how harmful and painful it is. And then maybe we'll dig a little bit deeper. I'll ask them, is that something you would say to me if I wasn't able to get to the next level or if I wasn't able to finish this on time or whatever it is that they need to do or feel pressured to do, how would you respond to me? And then for anyone else in the world, it's always, oh, that's okay. Yeah. You can try again. Yeah. And I'm like, exactly. It is okay. I can try again. And so can you. And so when we believe that no matter what happens, if we don't meet the expectation, the deadline, whatever, if it's always okay and I can always try again, then why do I have to be perfect? Exactly. Yeah. Why do I have to be fearful? Mm -hmm. And so we end up really healing that pattern by not making it perfect and like keeping that pattern intact because that's what perpetuates it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by realizing even if this pattern is not getting its need met of needing to be perfect, that's okay. And actually, that's what you need to show the pattern in order to heal it. You actually have to show up so imperfectly. You have to fuck it up so bad and see that that's okay. And what I love about life is that you will create so much anxiety and fear around your worst case scenario and then ultimately experience it at some point yeah yeah and thank god you do i love it when that happens i love it when that happens because thank god when that happens you realize you're actually fine Mm -hmm. it may not be a pleasurable experience in that moment but it happens you eventually accept it you move through it you choose a new thought or experience and move on And so when you experience the worst case scenario, you realize that all you were afraid of was how you were going to punish yourself in that moment. The moment doesn't actually punish you. Mm -hmm. The moment is so neutral. Whether or not that happens or doesn't happen is not heaven or hell. What's heaven or hell is what you believe about it. And so this is the other potent like cure to perfectionism and procrastination. Whatever happens, you can accept it. Mm. Yeah, and we've talked about this before, that acceptance does not mean you like it. Mm -hmm. It's just accepting that this is what's happened, right? Um, But I wanted to kind of go back to what you were saying earlier and something that I often say to my clients and frankly even to both you and I. Anytime you say something to yourself of like an expectation of this needs to be a certain way or if this happens then, you know, that would not be good if I did that. Anytime you do anything to that effect, you have to apply the same rules to everyone else. Everyone. Everyone else. And that will help you to externalize the actions that you're taking and to actually see the damage, as you said. Because the same thing for me, like I, um, so a lot of parents will start to embody perfectionistic tendencies because, Mm -hmm. especially conscious ones, because we don't want to traumatize our kids. We don't want to repeat the cycles our parents have done. And so in an effort to run away from ever experiencing that for our kids or ever being the cause of that, we try to do it perfectly. And I used to have this belief that my child is not going to be traumatized. She's never going to talk about me in therapy. I don't want to create these types of experiences, but that's actually what creates these experiences because of the pressure I put on myself. Pressure is another good P. Mm -hmm. Um, And so with my daughter, I remember this one time where I did kind of have this meltdown with her and I was really upset about it. And she kept saying, it's okay. It's okay. And I said, it's not okay. It's not okay. Mm, I I shouldn't have done that. It's not okay. And I'm thinking in that moment that I'm doing the right thing by like owning it and saying, it's not okay. Right. It wasn't until I saw her apply that same rule to herself that I saw, oh, that's perfectionism and that's not healthy. It's actually not helpful. So damaging. Because the next time she did something, um, I think she like cheated on a game or something like that. The card game. Yeah, it was a card game. And we kind of caught that she was cheating. And this was when she was, I don't know, three or four. Um, 
And we said, oh, hey, like, you know, you can't play it like that or whatever. And she felt so terrible. She felt so bad. She's like, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. That was so bad. And I said, it's okay. It's okay. And she said, it's not okay. It's not okay. Yeah. And as soon as she said that, I heard it. And I realized the in an effort to be a perfect parent, I was creating an expectation that she had to be a perfect child. Yeah. And in me being able to hold space for all all of my imperfections and actually naming them and actually being okay with them and accepting them and loving myself anyway, that's how she started to be able to love her mistakes Mm -hmm. and her flaws because we're all flawed. And to live in a world where any one of us is expected to get it right every single time, like you're just creating so much suffering for yourself and ultimately also the people around you because you start to set a bar for them too. Yeah, that's actually where I was going to lead into because what's so funny is obviously the fear behind perfectionism or procrastination is that we won't be accepted or loved, right? So we have to get it right. We have to do it properly or not do it at all, Mm -hmm. right? But this is the interesting thing I uncovered about my perfectionism. So what I realized was that I was actually starting to alienate the people around me. Yeah. Because I had such high standards for my life and myself, people felt like they couldn't be around me because they were like, well, if you judge yourself so intensely (laughs) for how you live and like lead your life, then what do you think of me? 100%. And I was like, nothing. Like, I don't think anything of you. Like, I love how you live your life. And they're like, "Mm, it kind of shows in the way you live your life, right? Because the way you judge yourself is ultimately the way you judge others. And so you have to, like Gina said, apply that rule to everyone. So if it's never okay for you to make a mistake, it's never okay for the entire world to make a mistake. Exactly. All of the rules apply to everyone because you are one with humanity. And so you are not a special exception. Mm -hmm. I say that a lot to my clients. You are not a special exception. If you are never allowed to feel your feelings, if you are never allowed to take a break, no one is. Yep. And they see how ridiculous it is. They're like, but breaks are good and healthy and mistakes are what helps you learn Mm -hmm. like they can see the beauty and all the things that they're shaming themselves for and i think that when you really learn how to see the beauty in those things with respect to yourself now you can love your process yeah now it's not about being perfect it's a it's another p process (laughs) (laughs) wow there's some alliteration today there's a lot of p's in this episode that's hilarious yeah and the funny thing too is that even If there was a way to get perfect, the way to get there would be through imperfect actions. It Mm. would actually be through trying and and having mistakes and getting back up and refining it. Like if there is a perfection level, it would be actually through the mistakes that you get there. No one just gets it right right away. But actually that your story, what you just shared is so valid because (laughs) Sam has very high standards for things for herself And Mm -hmm. I've really reduced them, though. You you have. You've gotten definitely (laughs) a lot better, for sure. But I remember when you went snowboarding and you were so mad that actually the first time you did really well, right? No, the first time I was terrible. Oh, it was really bad. But I went in with extremely, like, hubris expectations. Yeah, I was like, I'm going to be amazing. Like, what? Like, it's hard? (laughs) Elwoods. Um, yeah. And I remember you called me and you were so frustrated and you were like, I just kept freaking falling. And I know I don't have to be good at it right away, but I just kind of thought I would be. And I remember in that moment that if I didn't know you as well as I did, I would like never go snowboarding with you because you never want to do anything with me. I mean, I sometimes I don't like even dance class. You're like, come with me. I'm like, no, you're a professional dancer. No. And because I already have my own pressures on me, I Mm. don't want to be next to someone who also would look that intricately into themselves because I'm like, you're probably going to look that intricately into me. But the reality is you don't really give a shit about how well I do in reality. We're all very right intrinsically selfish people where we are self-centered mm-hmm. where we're focused so much on ourselves that most people do not have the time yeah. to focus that much on you well I started thinking about when I really wanted to heal my perfectionism I really started thinking about the embodiment of the person I wanted to be because clearly trying to embody being perfect was not a healthy way to live and mm-hmm. it was very punishing and it was very anxiety driven so I thought about the people who have made me feel the safest and mm. most warm in my life. I love that. And I realized that it was people who did not have high expectations of themselves. Wow. It was people who loved themselves, like laughed at the silly mistakes, like gave themselves another chance. It was actually the people who were so lovingly imperfect. Wow. That I felt so accepted around. Like, oh, 
I don't have to keep up this persona and this mask of perfection around you. Like, you're yeah. okay with you. And that makes me safe to be me. And so I decided to embody what it would be like to be that type of person. And then I felt like I was being that person for my inner self, yeah. for my inner child. And then my inner self around me yeah. was like, oh, like, you're okay with making mistakes and, like, taking your time. And, oh, I guess it's okay for me to do that. And this is the ironic thing, guys. It it doesn't actually impair your progress. Yeah. It accelerates it. It really does. It accelerates it because when you are trying to move from the wound of needing to get it right and the fear of what's going to happen to you or, or the punishment that's going to be on the other side of not being perfect, you are using such a bad fuel source. Like your yeah. fuel source is fear. And whenever I think about creating anything, the most effervescent, like effective energy is love. Yeah. Like we like to create from fear is just not going to be as beautiful and it's not going to be as I don't want to even use the word productive, but it's not going to be a process and give you a product that's going to really reflect love and acceptance. And so what is the point of it? Yeah. And a really visceral example of when you feel safer because somebody else has like shown their imperfections is anytime anybody on social, especially moms, share like, this is what my house looks the like. The relatable posts? Yeah. And I remember like one of my um, my friends, like we were talking about, oh my gosh, like sometimes the place is such a mess or like, oh my gosh, you should see like my office right now. You should see my car. And I remember she showed me and I was like, oh, okay, now I can show you how bad mine is today. And it is in that, you know, vulnerable share and that real life share that you can then feel safe, like you said, to like actually be like, oh wait, I'm like that too. And if we could just all show what we're actually all going through yeah. and how imperfect we are and start to accept that in ourselves, I just feel like the world would just continue to become such a better place. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's so hard though. I think especially growing up, if you were raised by parents who did expect a lot from you, I can completely see why we develop these patterns um, because we do get a lot of praise, another P, um, we mm -hmm. get a lot of praise when we do things a certain way. Um, for me, yeah. I it was really the absence of not getting in trouble. So I was working yeah. so hard to avoid getting in trouble. And so for me, perfectionist showed up or perfectionistic tendencies showed up not so I could feel good about myself so that I could try avoiding feeling bad. But the funny thing is, because you can't reach perfectionism, you feel bad. I always felt bad. And so to your point, when you're driven by fear, like I have to do this, I must do this or else versus I love that I'm doing this and I'm going to love myself through my mistakes. And I love seeing how my brain works when I figure this out. It's such a different experience because you're going into it knowing that it's going to be a little bit messy and that it should be messy. And I think the best teacher for this for me has been my daughter, Emmeline, because I can see the difference where she feels pressure to perform a certain way versus when I tell her, like, there literally is no mistake. It was like mm. the recital that she had. Like, she was so nervous about this, her first time singing solo on stage. And I could see the fear still popping up in her mind of what if I make a mistake? What if I forget the lines? Mm -hmm. What if I do this? And I said, you might. Like, you might. I said, actually, famous singers, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, they forget their lines all the time. And so right there, I'm trying to illustrate to her that no one's perfect. There's no expectation for you to do this without any mistakes. In fact, making the mistake is what will help you to continue to hone that craft. And again, trying to put the emphasis more on the way she's showing up how many times she's practiced, why she like loves the song, because she like loved the song she was singing. I said, it's you get to imagine what it would like to be singing in front of a bigger audience, you know, trying to change the stakes and trying mm -hmm. to change the intention and the purpose of this practice instead of it being, you've got to get this perfectly. It's this is the purpose of this experience is for you to experience more of yourself. The purpose yeah. of you getting up on stage is for you to experiment with how it feels like to be on stage to determine, do you want to keep doing that? And I, I learned from that experience so much because as I continue to create and create new offers and things that you and I are doing, I just want to embody that energy mm -hmm. of you're definitely not going to get it right perfectly. You know, you're definitely going to make mistakes. And those mistakes are actually what's going to help you to hone this skill even more and so just changing that dialogue but I just know a lot of us did not get that so I want to validate how difficult it can be 
Yeah, it can be so difficult. And we also live in a world now where we have to navigate a virtual reality that also rewards you for the illusion of being perfect, right? Totally. Like, we can't ignore that, that social media is, I mean, it's changing a little bit now. I think the landscape, like you said, there's a lot more like relatable posts and people doing like Instagram versus reality. But Mm -hmm. literally, you are getting the pleasure centers of your brain they're getting activated. You're getting that little dopamine hit for crafting the illusion of perfection. It's like, let me make my life appear so perfect through 2D images and then experience a hit of dopamine through it. So what we're learning or what the neural pathway is saying now is perfection equals love. Mm -hmm. Perfection equals belonging. And so we have to show ourselves over and over that imperfection equals belonging. And Mm -hmm. we could take this a step further and really do the work on questioning what perfection even is Mm -hmm. and whether or not it exists. Because I think for me, one of the biggest things that helped me let this go was realizing that I honestly was chasing a dragon. Yes. Like what I wanted wasn't real. But what my coach helped me realize was what you want from it is real. Yes. So yeah. what you, perfection is not real. And I'm like, mm, with a few tweaks, I think I could get there. <laughs> and it's like, no, like we're giving up on that. Like that's not real. Like that's a fact. It's kind of like gravity keeps you on the ground. Yes. Like let's keep that in mind. Yeah. So I was like, okay, perfection's not real. But why do I want that so bad? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I am perfect or my idea of perfect because perfection doesn't exist – I would get to accept myself. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that if you were perfect, there would be nothing to accept, Mm -hmm. right? So self-acceptance actually can only be experienced in the face of imperfection. Mm -hmm. Like that is true self-acceptance because if I need to be perfect in order to accept myself, I'm not accepting anything. Yeah. Like I'm just becoming like the perfect ideal in my mind that allows me to like be happy or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I can actually achieve that feeling or create and nourish that feeling, cultivate it through the acceptance of all of the things that I find imperfect within me. Mm -hmm. And so actually I realized by chasing perfection, I'm getting further and further away from what I desire, which is acceptance, self-acceptance and self-love because needing to be perfect to love myself isn't love. Right. And you talked about your childhood and how a lot of your experiences were actually reinforcing the pattern of needing to be perfect. Did you feel loved? Not at all. Not at all. Right. It's like you felt so unloved that you had to be perfect. Yes. And so by actually loving ourselves, we take away the pressure of needing to be perfect because you already have the love. Yeah. Right. Like Emily gets to go up on stage and sing and mess up because she already has the love. It's totally fine. Like mom's not going to abandon her at the doors like because she fucked up on the song, Mm -hmm. right? She goes up on stage knowing that what I need, which is love and my self-acceptance, I already have before I sing a single note. Yes. And that is the energy that we hope that you are able to embody as you embark on any creative journey or literally anything in your life. Like Mm -hmm. you don't need to extract self-love and acceptance on the other side of it. That's something you can give yourself now and then use that beautiful, creative, loving fuel to move towards that thing instead of with your fear. 100%. And I think seeing it in a child that way, you can see so viscerally the difference between the two because, mm. okay, let's just say like riding a bike, for example, right? She I did always used to be really bad at riding bikes. Oh, she was so <laughs> bad. And I mean, I was really afraid for her like safety. Right. Um, and so I did have to remove myself because I'm like, I'm creating too much pressure for this. But um, with riding a bike, if somebody said to you for the first time when you're learning how to ride that you can use training wheels, but you can't fall. And you can't make any mistakes. Like you have to make every turn perfectly. Mm. If you do, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. But here, get on the bike and let's learn. Like no one will want to do that. No one is going to want to get on that bike knowing that I I don't think I can do this without failing. I don't think I can do the turn without falling and scraping myself. So I'm just not going to do it at all. Versus if you position it like this is the bike. These are the training wheels. You can leave them on as long as you need to. When you feel ready to try without the training wheels, we'll try with or without the training wheels, you might fall and you might get scraped. And when that happens, I'll have a band-aid, we'll clean it up and we can get back on. Now you're actually setting the stage for what's actually going to happen, a realistic yes. expectation. And so now you've created safety that, oh, I'm supposed to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to fall. And then it makes it a lot easier to keep showing up. Now, when you compare those two examples, who's going to learn how to ride a bike faster? Yeah, It's going to be the one that 
is allowed to fall. And I think that's such a hard thing for people to see. I mean, we have so many clients that want to start YouTube channels, podcasts. They want to start a new business. And what stops them is not their inability to do it. It's literally the expectation that they're not allowed to make a mistake. Mm-hmm. They have to be perfect. They have to be perfect. That's what they don't feel ready for. They're not not ready for the thing. They're not ready to accept themselves no matter what happens when they try to do that thing. And so it's never, oh, I'm going to coach you on how to get better at that skill. It's more, we're going to be coaching you on how to be okay with whatever the process comes with when it comes to you and the way that you respond to yourself. And funnily enough, I feel like perfectionism shows up a lot in spirituality that once Mm -hmm. you start learning these concepts, that now you have to do that perfectly. I should know better. I already went through this before. Why am, why am I experiencing this again? So once again, you're expecting that your journey in spirituality and embodying these teachings is going to be perfect and you're not going to scrape yourself, make a mistake or ever get it wrong. And that's actually the antithesis of the teachings. It's literally the antithesis of the teachings. The teachings are literally love and accept yourself. No matter what. And everyone else. So yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Actually, I would go as far as to say is that self-love is self-acceptance. Like they're the same thing. They are the same thing. They're the same thing. And so you need to be able to do that in any given now moment in order yes. to experience enlightenment, if you will. So you're literally avoiding the practice by needing to perfect the practice. <laughs> yeah. Like the practice is accept whatever arises within the practice, right? Yes. And this came up a lot in my actual physical yoga practice practice because I came I was uh, trained as a professional ballet dancer so for me yoga got to be another one of those places where my perfectionism just like sneakily sit in there I was slid in there I was like perfect I will do all of the poses at the perfect angle the perfect like I will straighten my spine so well I will breathe perfectly Mm -hmm. and I made it this thing where I was trying to again master yoga so that I could accept myself And it felt like this thing I had to conquer each class. Like I wasn't experiencing peace all throughout the class. I had to like wait till I got to the end and had like performed well and I was like laying there. I'm like, okay, that was a good class. Rather than accepting everything that was arising throughout the class and seeing the practice as an acceptance practice. Like, yes, there's movement. And of course you want to create as much alignment as you can. But the point of the practice is not to perfect the practice. Mm -hmm. The point is to practice. And so I feel that way about my life. And wait, practice is another P. I was just going to say that, but I was (laughs) like, I've said it too many times. (laughs) But the point is to practice. And I think we talked about this maybe in the procrastination episode, which was episode 50. But if the point of your process is to practice, right, then it's perfection is out the door. Mm -hmm. It's not about perfecting. It was never about perfecting because perfection is simply Maybe, maybe a possible byproduct of your consistent practice. But again, even the perfection that you experience is just an arbitrary belief and thought because there is no perfection. So what if your life was about process and practice Mm -hmm. rather than perfection? Because, you know, I think about uh, that movie Soul. Have you watched it yet? Yeah, I have. It's so, I mean, everybody, it's so good. Actually, there's another Disney movie that we'll talk about after. That is also very, very great. It's so it good. Ties well so in if you haven't topic. watched it, this is going to spoil a lot of it for you. It's <laughs> one of the most spiritual movies I've ever seen. It's really not for kids. But at the end, after he gets his, he manifests his dream, right, of playing with the band. And already he's kind of thinking, like, what's next? Yeah. Like, he finally now? got there. What do I do now? And they're like, you come again tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you just like, do it again. Yeah. It'd be like me showing up to the studio and be like, what do we do next? It's like, we keep recording. Yeah. Like this is the practice. Like this is the dream life. I'm not trying to get somewhere else to find a more acceptable version of me. Like I am accepting me yes. and this is the process. Yeah. And it's made my life just feel so much more naturally creative because I'm not constantly motivated by fear. Yeah. Like fear is not a very creative like energy to be in. Like you actually technically you can't really be that creative from fear because it actually blocks off the parts of your brain that are responsible for like connecting dots and creative problem solving, meaning making, all of those things. You're just thinking about how to get to safety. Yep. Not exactly the most creative place to be coming from. So in releasing all of this perfectionism by first healing the wound of not being enough, right? Because I think all of it roots from that or that we're not going to be accepted or that we are unlovable in some way. I was able to just move through my life with so much more peace. And isn't that what we're all after? Isn't that why we want to be perfect anyways? 
That is why we want to be perfect anyways. But again, like I don't think in the moment you know that. And I think, again, if you haven't ever experienced self-acceptance or self-love, there can't be in that moment a belief yeah. that you will be able to. Um, because, I mean, at least for me, the only times I ever did feel quote unquote good about myself was when I would hit these certain markers or milestones and everybody else was saying, wow, that was amazing. Um, but it wasn't until I just felt the the emptiness in that mm-hmm. you know you can, it can only fuel you to a certain point it'll feel good it's kind of like if somebody keeps telling you you're beautiful but if you really don't feel that it'll feel good to a certain point and then eventually you will stop believing it. and then you need somebody else to tell you and then another yeah. person and eventually you could just get tired of that and then you are kind of realizing wait let me be the source of that um but you kind of do need to go through the practice of trying at least and at least experiencing what it would be like for you to just try that has been I mean for if you've been an OG spiraler you know when I started this podcast with Sam there was so much fear and the only way that I could keep showing up was releasing this idea that there would be a perfect episode or that there's going to be one episode where I get everything out because there's such a scarcity mindset when it comes to perfectionism where you believe that you've only got one shot and so we would have an episode on fear for example and after I'd be like damn it I wanted to say this and oh I wanted to talk about this story and I'd feel like that was an an imperfect episode because Mm -hmm. I didn't hit all those points now we're at episode 70 something And I'm like, oh, I've had multiple opportunities to continue to talk about this. And so anything that we believe we need to be perfect in kind of implies that you're probably going to be doing it for longer than one time, which means you have multiple opportunities to try this and to keep on going and to keep on adding to it. And it gets to be this body of work instead of this one masterpiece. And I also think about the most amazing artists in the world, the most amazing writers in the world, they don't just have one. If you think about a singer, I mean, I guess you could argue about the one-hit wonders, but even them, they have multiple singles that they've tried to put out or multiple songs that they've Mm -hmm. recorded before releasing. So when you actually look at anybody you perceive as perfect, you can actually see that behind them is multiple rough drafts multiple things that flopped that didn't work out and so when you actually break down the formula of people who are successful you know on the external plane you can see but are they successful because they've released a lot of music or are they successful because they love the creative process well that's that's exactly what i'm saying is that like Anybody you think on the outside is successful, really what's successful inside of them is the way that they treat themselves and that they have been able to get past the point where everything needs to be perfect. It's Mm -hmm. that they've done multiple flops. It's that they've written so many different times. And the more that I study different artists and writers, the more that I realize, oh, the reason why they're able to come up with this very resonant piece is because they didn't stop. They didn't stop at needing to be perfect. They kept working through that process and accepting themselves and accepting these quote-unquote rough drafts that are not you know good enough um and yeah that's been really helpful for me to see and I'm actually really excited about an upcoming guest um who's going to talk a lot about creativity and that process Mm -hmm. I mean I can't just help think about how literally the pursuit another p pursuit of perfection is just so much ego because it essentially says that through my pursuit of perfection I will become superior yeah and that could mean a couple different things. I will become superior than other people, yep. which is ego, mm-hmm. or I will become a superior version of myself, also ego, mm-hmm. right? This idea of superiority or inferiority is a false illusion. It only exists in our mind, right? We are all inherently worthy beings, or actually, we could throw out worthiness altogether. We're just all human beings, yes. right? Yes. And this idea of being superior or inferior only exists in the social construct, right? In the mind. And so if we are trying to be superior to ourselves or other people, we're just fabricating the idea that we're better than others. 100%. And that is not the basis upon which I think anyone can live a truly happy, fulfilling life. Yeah. Right? Like imagine if it was an artist's job or motive to be better than all other artists. <laughs> I mean, frankly, some people think it is. We wouldn't even like that person. No. Like, and also, we would feel it. We would, would feel it. But I think the reason why we like so many of the artists that we do is because we can feel that their music feels like a genuine channeled piece of raw emotion. Yeah. And usually we love artists that are really collaborative. Mm, right? True. So, yes. for example, Taylor Swift, she actually is a very collaborative artist. It's not mm. like I'm better than everyone. 
Mm-hmm. It's actually her belief that she's not better than everyone, has a lot to learn and a lot to gain from collaboration with other artists who have different styles and influences than her that has made her, quote unquote, the best. And yeah. e- even though I think she's the best, not everyone does. Right. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, you don't even like her. Yeah. I mean, you you're OK with her. Yes. Right. You have an interesting relationship with her. Yes. But <laughs> right. It's like her, even if she had reached her own idea of perfection. We have different opinions about it. Exactly. So really you're just trying to satisfy your own ego. Yes. Through perfection. And so for me, it's not about killing the ego because killing the ego is coming from the ego itself. Yes. But it's about learning to be aware of the ego and its desires and really integrating that part of you in a way that's deeply understanding. Like I'm deeply understanding of the part of me that wants to be quote unquote perfect. I'm like, oh, you want that so badly so that you can accept yourself. Well, guess what? I'm going to accept you. Yes. That, and my practice over the last year has just been like accepting everything. Mm-hmm. And it has led me to feel so much love. So much love. Yeah. Because how can I feel love when I need to be different than who I am? Exactly. Yeah. And often we were taught that we needed to do that. And honestly, it doesn't even just happen for parents. It really does happen from teachers in school and I'm seeing that even now with with my kid and and her schooling and it's it's really hard because I get it because they're trying to get them to perform a certain way um but then inherently what we learn is what I am doing is not good enough and if I do this this is good if I do this this is bad if Mm -hmm. I say this the teacher praises me if I say this I get in trouble right and it creates that paradigm um but yeah I I hope that this conversation is really helping people to, I guess, normalize even what happens in our minds. Because I think perfectionism yeah. can feel really isolating until you do the the work in community with other people and see like, oh my gosh, like other people also experience the same thing. And even the nuances of the way perfectionism shows up in our life. Um, yeah, I hope this is helping people. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that obviously takes time to unpack. But I think some of the key points are that perfectionism and procrastination are the same, coming from the same wound. They're twins, fraternal yeah. twins. I, I call them like the evil stepsisters. <laughs> yeah, evil stepsisters are like evil fraternal twins, right? Yeah. They are faces of the same wound. And that if you continue to perpetuate that you need to be perfect, what you are really believing is that you need to become superior through your perfection Mm -hmm. and that you can only accept yourself when you have become better than who you are, a.k.a. you need to be different than who you are. And needing anything to be different is non-acceptance and resistance. Yes. And I think another thing you can do and bring into your practice is when you experience maybe some level of perfectionism is asking yourself, what do I believe I will gain if I do get this perfectly. Like, what will I actually experience? What will happen? And once you start to unpack that, you'll see what you're actually after. You're not actually after perfectionism. Perfection. You're yeah. not actually after getting this perfectly right. You're actually after a feeling and a belief within yourself. And so, and again, like Sam said, once you unpack, oh, I'm actually just wanting self acceptance. And it might not even sound like that. Like, I think for me, I'm trying to think, like, with this podcast, when I really wanted to do it perfectly, um, I mean, there's maybe multiple things that I can name. What I believed I would get if I did this perfectly was approval from you. Oh, which you already had. Which (laughs) I already had. But it was like not good enough, right? It was like, no, I need more. Or like, I need you to say it was perfect or whatever. And I think what I believed I would feel is like finally like good about myself. But it's like, I'm not going to get it through that. I'm not going to get it by setting the stage by saying you suck. So do this perfectly. And Mm -hmm. then I'll think that like, you're not actually going to trust that that's going to give that to you, even if you could do it that way. And the other funny thing about perfectionism is asking yourself, how would I know if it's perfect? Like, how would you actually know that a podcast is done perfectly? How would you know that? Yeah. Like, what is a perfect podcast? Well, and what is a perfect post? Like, how would you know it's good enough? How do you Mm. actually measure that? And once you start doing that work, your brain will start to kind of implode because you realize, oh, I've actually created this literal impossible standard that has no criteria. Like, imagine if you went into a job and they said, hey, we need to make sure you perform well, but there's no scorecard. You just have to make sure you do the job perfectly. And you're like, but like, what's the job? And they're like, to do it perfectly. (laughs) But there's no marker. It's not like X amount or by this time. There's no criteria. Mm. And that's the environment we set for ourselves, which is why it feels so overwhelming because it's literally impossible. It literally is impossible. Yeah. And I felt the same way about myself when I had to kind of come up with my perfect criteria. Um, 
I actually had a pretty strong list myself. Um, I came up with this list of things I had to do in a day and um, this percentage of growth I had to experience. <laughs> and and so I remember my coach was like, so you're a company. And I right. was like, yes. I mean, I, I am the CEO of my business. And she's like, no, but we evaluate companies, not people, right? Yeah. And it was just interesting to have reduced myself so much to statistics and removing my human experience well, like you reduce yourself to a product exactly and actually that's what capitalism wants yep so actually the greatest antidote to your capitalist woes all your internalized sense of i need to be productive and perfect is to accept yourself as you are that's the antidote <laughs> that's it that's it obviously a process that requires a lot of acceptance <laughs> Like you have to be accepting of your non-acceptance and you have to oh be, my gosh, yes. you have to be a hundred percent. You have to start there. Yeah. I had to accept my non-acceptance because I was like, I don't want to accept it. Okay. I accept that I don't want to accept it. Mm -hmm. so that's step one. But also accepting of all the ways in which your perfectionism continues to find itself in your life. Um, because I would feel like, okay, I got, I got rid of that pattern, right? Yeah. Again, that's ego because I'm trying to be perfect by getting rid of the pattern now. <laughs> but I'd be like, it would come up again and I'd be like, oh, that's interesting saw that, okay, accepting that that's still there, mm -hmm. right? And then that acceptance muscle just gets so strong to where it's not afraid of experiencing anything anymore because you know that you're going to accept it. And when I think about love, I think about, you know, being in the arms of a mother who is like completely okay and self-loving, not self-loving, loving of you, right? She would maybe be self-loving. That would probably be good as well. <laughs> but she would be so loving and accepting of anything you do or don't do and yeah. that's all we've ever wanted and some of us had mothers like that or parents like that and some of us didn't mm -hmm. right most of us actually experienced that we ex uh, the most praise when we were better than other kids like and what and not actually inherently better than other kids but or like doing but yeah. yeah proceed to be better by doing better in school or whatever maybe you were more talented artistically musically whatever and you receive praise for that and so what we learn is I have to be better than other people yes and then we start the comparison game mm -hmm. right we keep on judging other people gauging like is that one better am I better is this better is that is you know whatever and and yeah the cycle then continues mm -hmm. I basically just gave up trying to be better than other people because I realized that made me an asshole <laughs> It really does. Like, if you're really out here trying to be perfect, you are trying to be better than other people. And we need to out you for that. Lovingly. Yeah, lovingly. Totally. Because if you feel better that, like, oh, my God, that person sucked. So, yay, I I'm better than them. Like, that's also going to, like you said, feel people will feel that. And I just don't think any of us want to live in that. Uh, because yeah. then it also perpetuates the belief that other people are also thinking that about you, which creates more of an environment for us to believe we need to show up in a certain way yeah. now when it comes to healing this wound um i actually said this on one of the spiraling higher community calls recently with one of our amazing people seppi where she was talking a little bit about how she had to show up a certain way or you know whatnot and the thing that i told her was when you're first trying to embody this self-acceptance through whatever mistakes or this imperfect action you are allowed and have permission to start with something smaller. So yeah. something with literally no stakes to you. So it might not be the best idea to start right away on something that feels very tender to you, um, but something that you can start doing, like what I did was starting to color again and starting to just draw again, because I literally have no expectation that I'm gonna be good at this right away. But as I was doing it, the process was so fun. And I drew, I was drawing like cinema roll. And um, <laughs> you were doing so well. It honestly, it looks pretty legit. I'm pretty actually good. pretty impressed by myself. But imagine how I approached that being like, I must draw this perfectly. Instead, I was like, I'm totally going to butcher this. I'm going to keep on, a, I have an eraser. I erased it. I kept trying. I kept asking my husband and my daughter, does this look like him? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, the head looks a little bit wonky. I was like, you're right. Let me fix this. Whereas had I asked them to do that around, I don't know, the podcast or something, and they said, mm, you sounded like this, that probably would have stung me too much and drove me right back into perfectionism. But because it was drawing a Sanrio character that I literally don't care about, it was such a good experience for me to experiment what it would feel like for me to try something and have no stakes. And I accepted myself no matter what. There was nothing on the line here. Mm -hmm. And the way that I showed up was, I actually want to try this again. I want to try drawing this character. I want to try drawing that character. And if we could apply that 
incrementally to the other things in our life that maybe seem quote unquote bigger, again, like you'll actually show up so much more often, which will then Mm -hmm. actually give you the result that you want, which is to actually do this thing and to feel good while you're doing it. Yeah. For me, like with the podcast, for example, I just have a deepening desire to become more skilled, but not a better version of myself. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I don't actually believe that becoming more skilled makes me a better version of myself because then like I'd have to have every single skill in the universe. Like I'd have to know how to change a tire, which I literally don't. Like I'd have to become an electrician. I'd have to become an audio engineer. Like I don't have these skills. Right. But there are certain skills that I want to simply obtain for my own life and self. But I don't believe that the honing of the skill makes me better or more valuable. Yeah. It doesn't change or dilute or enhance you. Yeah. Like for you, you were totally valuable before you knew how to draw. Yeah. Like, now you just know how to draw a little bit better. Yeah. And that's cool. Like, that, that's cool that you were able to acquire that skill and hone it through curiosity and play. Yeah. But I'm sorry. It doesn't mean anything about you. I'm not a better person. You're not a better it. person. <laughs> the funny thing about the drawing, and I guess the reason why maybe that subconsciously popped up for me, is that it was a perfectionistic thing that I used to use. So growing oh, up yeah. in high school, like, I actually was a really good artist. I was always in some form of art school. I loved it. And I remember I'd asked my mom to put me in these, like, special painting, you know, classes or whatnot. And, you know, I feel like high school really did me. Because <laughs> I feel like that's really that's where I went from doing things for the fun of it to realizing, oh, if it's not a certain standard, this is what happens. And so with drawing, it was the same thing. It would be me being excited, bringing it home. And my mom either just, you know, blinking at it or not even looking at it or whatever, or maybe saying, you know, that looks kind of weird. And then I just started going into my shell of, I'm never going to feel that again. And so the way that I'm going to do that is by just never drawing again. Yeah. And so I stopped engaging in that. And it was actually the same thing with singing. We've talked about many times as well. I stopped even trying to like sing for the fun of it because I wasn't making an album. And Again, the stakes were so high, but I fell back in love with even writing. Writing has been another thing I've come back to because I've released this perfectionism label, which I honestly didn't even think I was trying to be perfectionist because I have the awareness that I'm not trying to write something perfect, but it's perfectionistic if you are going to, in some form, judge yourself for doing it in any way, Mm -hmm. right? I think perfectionism shows up. You know that it's online if you're going to judge yourself for Mm -hmm. the result yeah like if you're not if you're doing it for any other reason than to do it itself yes which is so funny because I was obviously a professional dancer but then when I quit I just quit dancing cold turkey I know which a lot of people thought was crazy because they were like don't you love dancing and I was like why would I do it if I'm not like training to be professional or something they're like um because Because it's fun like Like, and so I literally started dancing for fun again this past year and I have a showcase coming up this weekend but we joke all the time that we're just like adults who dance for no reason other than we just really like doing it exactly and so we're not trying to find like perfection or achievement through it like we already know there's no reward for this like adult hip-hop class Like, like we're literally just here for the vibes and I've realized how just how fruitful that is like to show up to do something just for the fun of it because that's flow state 100 percent. flow state is i'm fully present with what i am doing i'm not trying to get somewhere else i'm not in my mind i'm present with this activity this experience and it's blissful and i would argue that if you could measure bliss and joy and the feeling of, of love and acceptance like comparing your journey in ballet where you did have to be perfect. Like it's literally Mm -hmm. like shifting your body and your bones to be a perfect line or whatever Um, compared to how you show up in your hip hop dance class. Like the comparison between the two are so stark. So stark. You actually want to show up for hip hop because it's fun and it's playful and there actually isn't anything on the line. You don't get like a solo. I mean, even if you did, it would all just be like for Mm -hmm. fun with the, the friends and everything. But in ballet, like you would get the lead role, which some people might say, is better because you're getting a professional lead role whereas hip-hop it's like not for anything but you're actually gaining so much more from the hip-hop class you're gaining so much more love you're gaining so much more experience of life just having fun and joy and it's actually so much more um like fruitful but that's not even the word that I want to say it's it's richer it's a fullness yeah it's more full whereas the other one was just for the title of the lead role, perhaps, or because you wanted to, um, you know, maybe 
impress somebody, not just you. I'm talking about people in general who have yeah. those professional things. And it makes me really sad because somewhere along, along the line, it changes from a pure love to like a pure need to prove something. And I just, I hope, I don't know. I, I want my daughter to never have to experience that, but I'm also like, you're going to have to. <laughs> Cause I just, I see how much she loves what she does yeah. and she's not thinking about how good she is. She's just doing it cause she loves it. And I yeah. just hope everyone gets to experience that. We all have a thing that we did that we that we did out of love as children that we distorted ultimately yeah. out of our ego. And so the goal of the work is to get back to that childlike state where you are doing the thing for the joy of it and not for the self-acceptance of it. So I guess our question to end this episode is really what would you do or how would you do what you are doing differently if your self-worth and acceptance wasn't on the line? Yeah. Because when you take that off the line – the whole thing is playful. Yeah. To take it a step further, it would be also to asking, it would also be to ask if no one could see mm. what you were doing, how would you show up differently? Because there is the level of self-acceptance and self-love that we need. But I think the, the wall before that is I want other people to accept this and think this is good. And so if no one could see that, like if no one listened to this podcast, which is kind of how I had to tell myself in the beginning, like I had to kind of that believe mm -hmm. that in order to show up this way like you would show up so much more like yourself yeah and there's also going to be things that you realize if no one was looking at you wouldn't do at all yeah right remember when I was trying True. to run the marathon <laughs> that was a hundred percent ego-driven pursuit I was like I'm gonna run the marathon I'm gonna post it on my social media and everyone's gonna know that I ran 42 <laughs> something kilometers and I remember thinking to myself if I could tell no one yes that I ran this marathon would you do it? Would I do it? And I was like, fuck no. <laughs> like, I don't give a fuck about doing this marathon. I just want people to know that I did it. Like, it was it was such a, like, see me doing this thing and approve of me and think I'm great or whatever, as if I'm becoming superior through marathon running. And then I realized how ridiculous that was. And so unless true. I'm doing it for me or if it's, like, a service-driven thing, I'm I'm out. Like, mm. and so I did not run the marathon. I have run half marathons. Those were, like, personally to show myself that I could do it. But – I didn't need to run twice the distance to prove that to myself. And that's what's so funny. I have zero desire to prove that I can run a marathon. Right. Like zero. And that's how you just know that this <laughs> these perfectionistic goalposts yeah. are just so arbitrary. They're so... And subjective. So subjective. Yeah. So get curious about the things that you try to find your perfectionism through or the things that you constantly avoid and procrastinate yeah. because therein lies whatever you have staked yourself worth on. And so what we're asking and lovingly inviting you to do is to unstake it, like take it away, right? Disempower that thing or that achievement or that next level from giving you what you want from it, which is your self-acceptance. And yeah, the self-acceptance journey is truly the only one I believe worth being on. It's the only one that matters. It's the only one that matters. Okay. Well, we hope you love listening to us rant about perfectionism and a little bit of procrastination. We talked more in depth about procrastination specifically on episode 50. Yeah. So if you need to hear more about that, go check that out. And don't forget to join our free community where we host connection calls the last Sunday of every single month. You'll meet your conscious besties and we post about exclusive updates in there, just like our upcoming retreat. <gasps> Wow, you dropped it. I, I just felt called to. Do it. Yeah. This is the first time we're mentioning it. So <laughs> it's coming. If you've wanted to be a part of our retreats, just so you know, community finds out first. So make sure you're inside. Yeah. And we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this honest conversation. We hope it brought you peace, clarity, and a little bit further along your spiritual journey. If you loved this episode, it would mean the world to us if you left us a five-star rating and a review so we can bring you more conscious conversations, spiritual topics, and guests. And we lovingly invite you to join our free Spiraling Higher community by clicking the link in the show notes to continue this healing dialogue and share with us how this episode impacted you. Come on in, introduce yourself, and meet your conscious besties in a safe space for healing conversations between us and other like-minded people on their healing journey. Here's to spiraling higher.